Welcome to Total Spectrum Spotlight, an informative look and an insightful discussion of today's legislative issues and political trends. Hi, I'm Congressman Eric Paulson, and welcome to today's Total Spectrum Spotlight. We are very enlightened to have a special guest with us today, U.S. Senator Shelley Moore Capito. She was first elected to the U.S. Senate from West Virginia in 2014 and was just reelected this last fall. She not only is the first woman U.S. Senator in West Virginia's history, but she also represented West Virginia's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives, where I was fortunate enough to serve with her on the deputy whip team and uh, enjoyed that opportunity very much. And she is now in the Senate serving on the Appropriations Committee, uh, the Commerce and Science and Transportation Committee, the Rules Committee, and also she is the ranking member of the Environment and Public Works Committee. In other words, she is a key player in a lot of the current discussions going around, uh, going on in the infrastructure bill right now in Capitol Hill. One fact, uh, some fun facts to know about uh, Shelley, she is a, has a BS in zoology from Duke University. Probably not too many members of the Senate, uh, Shelley, have a <laughs> zoology major. Um, and she also has a master's of education from the University of Virginia. She's a very competitive athlete. I know follows Duke very closely, although they didn't make the bracket this year in the NCAA. Um, and I know she's also a good tennis player. And so it's a pleasure to have you with us today, uh, Shelley. Thank you for joining, joining us, Senator Capito. Well, thanks, Eric. It's good to see you on Zoom. And it, it was a pleasure to serve with you. I remember we went to Israel, I think, together. And yes, uh, that was a terrific trip that we were able to experience that. So um, I'm glad to know you're doing well. Well, you're, uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll uh, appreciate some of the questions we're going to jump in today because you've been part of a lot of these discussions. You know, the infrastructure bill, of course, which the president now is proposing a, about $2.3 trillion, I think it is. Uh, and a lot of us think of infrastructure as roads and bridges and water resources, maybe broadband and the like. And it does seem like there's a little bit of an evolving definition of infrastructure today. Uh, but what all is part of the president's plan? Just give us a quick snapshot. Well, the president came forward with a uh, really enormous and uh, massive uh, infrastructure package. Uh, he's characterized it as a jobs bill. And, and you and I know that the traditional infrastructure packages that we've passed in the past bipartisan together uh, have been jobs bills. You know, think about building a road or repairing a bridge or, or uh, working on a port. Uh, that's a lot of construction jobs. It's a lot of um, other kinds of engineering and other, other kinds of jobs. So they are, infrastructure is a job creator and a job sustainer. And there's also safety aspects of infrastructure and modernization and the other things that are exceedingly important. And we usually do these bills every five years. What the president has done is not, you know, if you think of infrastructure in, in your mind and in my mind, I think of roads, bridges, ports, airports, uh, wastewater, water plants, uh, maybe brownfield, uh, and probably broadband now in this modern infrastructure. So that's the core of what I think we should be focusing on. The president has loaded his bill up with a whole lot of other things, um, whether it's um, money for Medicaid to, to put more money in Medicaid, more money into home health, uh, you know, uh, right to work, working to get rid of right to work in the states where it's effective. It just is far afield, I think, from what we think of as a traditional and, um, and solid bipartisan core of infrastructure. And so from that aspect, I, I'm sort of disappointed. I went to the White House a month ago to talk to him about this and he was talking big and I get that, but I think we can be robust and big and have a job creator and still hit our core infrastructure needs, which are quite great. Good. You know, let me just follow up on the broadband yeah. component. I, I know that you're sponsoring some separate bipartisan legislation with Senator Hassan, I believe, to you know help close that rural urban digital divide. Do you, do you think addressing access to broadband in the end is going to be a priority among many of your colleagues and be included in this package? Well, when I got uh, when I came to the Senate, I started the broadband uh, Senate Rural Broadband uh, Caucus, and as you know, every state, even even the most urban states, still have a lot of uh, rural areas that are either unserved or very much underserved. And certainly the pandemic put a bright light on that. And, and so we've been trying to work with the FCC, the USDA and others 
to tr and even in our COVID packages that we passed to try to broaden broadband for uh, to places for education purposes, work purposes, healthcare purposes, tourism purposes. It's it's just really unending. What uh, and so I think of that as a modern infrastructure, a must have, a uh, a way for your children to be able to continue school under difficult circumstances, a way for uh, somebody in rural West Virginia to get uh, a mole looked at by a dermatologist when they don't have one in within, you know, 60, 70, 100 miles of them. So there's all kinds of ways that I think broadband has really moved up to the top of the heap. What I'm not interested in doing is just building redundancy or rebuilding and, and, and up in people's speeds when we still have so many people that are unserved. So broadband will be a part of this. I think that there's bipartisan consensus on this. And, you know, I really look forward to the day when we could quit talking about whether you have broadband or not, because uh, I think that it is uh, such an essential part of um, all aspects of our life as, as we move forward. So, you know, we've seen a lot of different plans. Um, we'll see what, what, we can, what we can do together, because I think it is, it's something that definitely pulls us together. And there is a divide. I'm working with Hassan on a divide. I'm working on with some other people on mapping. I'm working on with Klobuchar on some other things. This is, it definitely doesn't have any um, geogra or geographic or political boundaries. That's great. Well, and we certainly, I think, appreciate your leadership in that area. Um, you know, you mentioned a lot about this package and, and with the COVID relief bill, the, the Democrats decided to, you know, go that partisan route, use this reconciliation process to pass the bill in a hurry with no Republican support. What role do you think Republicans are going to play in the process on this current package on infrastructure? And, and will you be allowed to play a role in the end? Well, uh, it was a disappointment to the 10 of us Republicans who went to the White House uh, to try to negotiate a COVID package with the president. Um, he seemed eager to do it, but then, you know, it's almost as if when we walked out of the room, uh, the reconciliation talks really, um, you know, accelerated and we were left in the dust, so to speak. And there's been a little bit of a back and forth between the White House and that particular group of 10 as to who was really negotiating. But I can tell you, we were, we were planning to negotiate. We came in with our bottom figure, which is what you do, and uh, we never got a response. So that's very disappointing. I am concerned that that could happen again. When you have the president way over $2 trillion, when you have our tradition, you know, only 5% of it uh, is going towards traditional roads and bridges, you know, infrastructure uh, construction that we think about, and a lot of this is social infrastructure that he's put on top of this, it does seem like we're very far apart. That's why I keep saying, let's carve out the areas, Mr. President, that we know we can have consensus on. And we can go bigger here than maybe if Republicans were writing the bill, we might do. So we're willing to look at that uh, and make it robust because of how important it is and how important it is to show the American people we can work on traditionally uh, traditional areas that have really had no political boundaries. And so far, uh, the White House has been engaged in our conversations. I'm working a bipartisan bill with Senator Carper from Delaware over on EPW. Uh, we're going to try to get that out by May. We're making great progress there. So um, I, I think there's a little bit more of an indication that we're going to be a part of the process, but until that actually happens, I still worry that it'll be a repeat of what happened with the COVID. Uh, they'll make it partisan and then basically throw us under the bus, so to speak, and say, we're not interested. We didn't want to negotiate. And that, that is not the case. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, let me ask you about this. You know, earmarks uh, are kind of coming back. You know, they're banned back, I think, in 2010. Right. Uh, the House Democrats and House Republicans and Senate Democrats are, sounds like, are planning to allow them again. Um, I don't know if the Republicans in the Senate have had that conversation. You sit on the Appropriations Committee. So how do you think this is going to evolve in terms of some changes in that appropriations process? Are earmarks coming back? Well, I think earmarks are definitely coming back. I don't see any any way that they're not with Republicans on the House side uh, voting within their conference to allow that. Uh, and it's interesting because many of them probably didn't serve, has probably never had an earmark. Now I served for 10 years with earmarks 
and you know did responsible earmarking and and I come from a state that has a lot of Robert C. Byrd earmarks all over the place. People joke about it. So um, I am I am not an anti earmark senator, although there are many in the Republicans uh, who feel quite differently than I do. But I think the reality is the ear, earmarks are going to be coming back through the Appropriations Committee. And I think the decision that's going to be have to be made by individual senators is if you don't believe in earmarks, don't earmark. I mean, just, you know, stay out of the process. Those of us who don't have a problem with this, I plan to submit earmarks uh, myself. And, uh, you know, it, depending on how it's, it's framed, it hasn't been fully fleshed out yet. But I don't see, you know, if they're going to send a bill, the House is going to send a bill over here. This bill, so your choice is basically, do I let the House earmark everything? Do I let the Senate Democrats earmark everything? Or do I participate in a transparent process of what we would call congressionally um, um, uh, designated spending and, uh, or earmarks? And so I think some people are going to make tough decision. For me, it's not a tough decision because I was never anti-earmark to begin with. Well, and I think as just you had pointed out, you know, the earmark process is a little foggy to the public, but a big part of it is just transparency, right? And right. Uh, being on the appropriations committee and having been with them and without them, um, you know, how do you just quickly answer if someone who thinks that earmarks drive spending up? You know, what, what's your response to that on federal spending? Well, my understanding is that the that the amount of dollars that are going to be allowed for earmarking is part of the overall spending dollars. So there's no additional spending on top of what uh, would be our uh, allotted uh, 30. It's called a 302A, I think, um, number, top line number. And and so let's say I'll use this as an example. Let's just say that one of my airports has been working for 20 years to get a new terminal and they've raised some money, but they, you know, they're a million dollars short, just say. And I would maybe in the transportation bill, if that's one of the accounts that you can, that you can earmark to and there'll be restrictions, I would transparently where everybody can see, ask for a million dollars for this airport to complete their terminal project. That, that would be an example of how you might use an earmark. Now, how could they get the money otherwise? They could be in a competitive grant program, they could try to raise the money, they could borrow the money. There's all their possibilities. But, you know, and, and so you can see, and, and you know, having served, you can spot in your own areas where the real committed need is, it just needs that bump of funding that, uh, that an earmark can provide. It, you know, it would have to go to a nonprofit or government agencies, no private earmarking. It's transparent, you have to submit. So you, you, know, you have to be able to withstand whatever withering criticism you would have for submitting a certain, uh, a certain earmark. And also if you're not unsuccessful in your earmark, let's say you ask for, I ask for that and I don't get it, I still have to disclose that I've asked. So we put a lot of guardrails that weren't in there before. I'm sure the amounts of money that you're talking about will be much, remember the bridge to nowhere and other things were enormous amounts of money and, uh, and, and the process was abused. I don't see that happening under these new parameters. Great, great, uh, great answer. And uh, thanks for shedding some light on that. Um, let me ask you this, there's been a lot of media drama about the Senate filibuster and two of your Democratic colleagues in particular from your state and Senator uh, Manchin, of course, and Senator Sinema from Arizona have stated that they wanted to retain the filibuster process, you know, in, to, in order to pass major legislation, have some bipartisan buy-in with 60 votes rather than just 50-50. What do you think is gonna happen in, in that, that area? Are there gonna be some changes to that process or, you know, is, it, is the track record of compromise and pragmatism, pragmatism gonna, gonna continue? Well, I think that uh, both Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema have taken very strong stands uh, for the sake of the institution and really for the longevity of the voices of the, of the minority. In the Senate, different from the House, the Senate is supposed to be the cooling platter where, um, you know, you all, uh, we always joked in the House side about, you know, all oh, those old people over in the Senate and they move so slowly and all those things. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a reason a senator has a longer term. 
you can study things in more depth, you can uh, become uh, much more policy driven in certain circuits if you want. And so I would say that preserving the filibuster preserves those voices and forces negotiation. And in this 50-50 Senate, that means you got to pick up 10 people from the other side. Well, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to get their ideas. And second of all, you have to, you have to, you're forced to um, maybe give up some things or, or, or take some things that you don't really want. And, um, and I think that prevents bad policy from moving forward. I think it also prevents wild swings in policy. If every two years things turned over and there was no filibuster, then um, you could ostensibly change, change everything pretty dramatically. Uh, the House can do that, but that's why the Senate is sort of like, let's cooler heads prevail here, what's better for the longevity. So I think Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema, and I think there are other Democrats that don't want to break the filibuster. They have talked about some reforms where people would stand up and talk. I, you know, I, I don't know what that would entail. Well, if, if they get really serious about it, I'm sure we'll look at it. But I don't think breaking the filibuster is a good idea when Democrats are in charge. And I, don't, I didn't think it was a good idea when the Republicans were in charge. Hmm. Yeah, well, thankfully, you have a really good track record of working across the aisle, as demonstrated by our conversation today. It does seem like it's getting harder for some of the parties to build that consensus when they're legislating. But I know that one of your motivations in terms of even going from the House to the Senate was not only to break up and restore some order to gridlock in the Senate, but also knowing that a lot of today's challenges really do demand bipartisan solutions and cooperation across the aisle. So we hope you continue to work in that, that mantra and uh, the benefit the country and not only your state, of course. Well, when I started my state, well, I was in the minority party in my state when I started. I was the first one Republican elected in, oh gosh, I think it was 20 years, but I'm the first Republican Senator since 1954. So, you know, we had a history of being dominated by one party. Well, guess what? We're dominated by the other party now. But what I learned in the minority is, in a way, I mean, I was one of 22 out of 100 in the state house, is that if, you, if your principal motive of getting elected is to try to get things done, and if you simply stand on a philosophical stand that eliminates your ability to get anything done, you don't get anything done. And then why are you here? So that's sort of the attitude I have. I learned a lot being in the minority. I learned that conversations and relationships are important. It's a little more difficult here to do that. It really is, um, but it's not impossible. And, and so we're moving forward on that. Well, that's wonderful. Well, Godspeed to you uh, you know, in, in that effort. And uh, we wish you the best also in terms of the, the new packages that uh, you're part of the, the key negotiators, visiting with the president, visiting with your colleagues. And thanks for taking the time to join with us today. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Well, thank you, Eric. It's good to see you. And, uh, you know, I, I am a very optimistic person. I think you are too. And I, I'm going to remain optimistic on this until, until somebody closes the door on me. So I'm going to keep going in there fighting and uh, trying to bring a good, a, a good result for, for the American people. So thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for watching Total Spectrum Spotlight. For more information about Total Spectrum, please visit us at totalspectrumsga.com. Total Spectrum, strategies uniquely focused on your success.